آزادی بیان یعنی لون زیو فری سپیچ ویلکم تو دیس ویچ ایز ایت آر لاست میدیا و پولیتیک سمینار اف دیس ترم and I'm really pleased to welcome Cato Reagan, um, who's director of the Guanabara Institute of Human Rights, which is a brand new institute here in Oxford. Started just in 2016, and Kate's the founding director of that. And that's um, a center which is, um, I suppose, a bit, a bit like the Reuters Institute, in a different kind of way, trying to connect um, academic study of uh, human rights law with the practice of human rights law and connecting the two together, rather as we try to do with journalism. Uh, Kate's um, uh, been uh, a lawyer and uh, for a long time a judge in South Africa and she was uh, made a member of the South African Constitutional Court in 1994 by Nelson Mandela and for at least its first decade she was one of the only two female judges on that court and um, she was on the court for 15 years until 2009. Uh, since then, she's been involved in other um, uh, similar kind of uh, um, activities. She's an ad hoc judge on the Supreme Court of Namibia, and she's involved with quite a lot of um, NGOs in the areas, uh, broad areas of human rights and, and, and freedom and democracy and the rule of law. Um, she's going to talk this evening on media freedom and free speech in South Africa. Um, you'll see there's a, a recording device here, and uh, she's happy for her talk to be on the record, but... When she's finished her opening sort of presentation, we move on to Q&A. We'll turn off that, and uh, she'd like that to not be attributed without asking her before if you want to quote her. So, Kate, welcome here. Thank you very much for coming along, and uh, over to you. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for the invitation to come and talk about uh, media freedom in South Africa. So what I thought I would do is I'll talk a little bit, very briefly, about the past, because uh, one of the uh, truths about South Africa is that it's very difficult to understand the present without actually having a bit of a sense of its history. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the key provisions in the constitutional framework, being a lawyer and a former judge. Obviously, I come at these things very much from a legal perspective. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about media freedom and where we are, where the kind of big indexes see South Africa being at. And then I'm going to talk about three areas that have come up before the courts, and which are of particular interest, I think. Firstly, media in the courts. Uh, then secondly, the law of defamation and libel. And thirdly, hate speech, which is a big issue in South Africa. But very happy to answer questions more broadly than the areas in which I cover. I've also formulated in a PowerPoint, so if anybody's actually interested in having the text and the provisions of the Constitution and so on afterwards, I'm very happy to provide that to you. So, of course, um, so the, uh, the history of South Africa and the apartheid era, at least, uh, was one of great repression of speech. Not only political speech, but also um, speech which was considered to be harmful of public morals. Uh, we had an active sort of censorship program under a piece of legislation called the Publications Control Act, in which films and books would have to be presented to a board of uh, public uh, of kind of controllers or censors who would decide what and, um, could be sold and what films could be shown and that films would be cut and so on. Um, the political controls were, 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 were egregious. Um, a whole range of political movements which opposed apartheid were outlawed and banned. And any materials that they produced or, and very often even mentioning of their names or wearing of their insignia uh, would, uh, would breach criminal prohibitions and would, would end with you in jail. I mean, there was a very famous case of a, of a worker who had a mug with ANC written on it, you know, like his was work mug, and this ended up with a prosecution. So the controls on political speech were, uh, were extraordinarily deep. Um, and so when uh, the process of negotiations at the end of apartheid began, the issue of speech, of course, and the regulation of the media were right at the forefront. Perhaps one other thing I should say about that is that um, although radio broadcasting started in South Africa in the 1920s, we didn't actually have television broadcasting until the mid-1970s. And in fact, there was no lawful... Um, broadcasting of uh, radio or television, which wasn't state-controlled. So we had a state-controlled control, um, press uh, or broadcasting organisation, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, which is still in existence, um, which controlled uh, all television and radio uh, in the country. And of course, that um, uh, that was something again that was very much under discussion in the in the lead up to the um, to the to the, to the new constitutional era. 
So that era really began on the 2nd of February 1990 when President de Klerk announced in his um, opening of Parliament address that he was going to unban the liberation movements, the parties that had been banned, and commence a process, release political prisoners, including, of course, famously Nelson Mandela, and start a process of constitutional negotiations. I often wonder in my own mind exactly what he th was thinking was likely outcome of this process he began on the 2nd of February 1990 never entirely clear to me whether he really thought that we were going to end up with a one-person, one-vote democracy within four years. But of course that is in fact what did happen. Um, and we ended up with a very strong constitutional framework with a strong Bill of Rights um, which protected, amongst other things, uh, free speech. So the South African constitution of today is in fact a 1996 constitution, and that's because after the first democratic elections in 1994, there was a period of two years when the, uh, those who had been elected to our parliament, our national legislature, sat in another institution, which was the Constitutional Assembly, and drafted the constitution, which is the current South African constitution. Um, and that constitution uh, has a very strong protection for freedom of speech. So section 16.1 of the Constitution says, everyone has the right to freedom of expression, which includes freedom of the press and other media, freedom to receive or impart information or ideas, freedom of artistic creativity, and academic freedom and freedom of scientific research. Now, those of you who will be familiar with the ways in which expression or speech are protected in constitutions and bills of rights around the world will know that this is very much a sort of third generation of that. It's much broader, it's much clearer in scope than you would find either in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution or in many of the constitutions that were, were, were drafted um, before the sort of second half of the 20th century. In many ways, South Africa was able to draw on the experience of constitutional frameworks all over the world in drafting its constitution. And, for example, the second provision of that, the freedom to receive or impart information or ideas, has actually formed quite an important part of the jurisprudence in South Africa, this idea that one of the reasons that we protect freedom of expression in the media is because of the entitlement of individuals to receive information and also to impart it. But Section 16 has another provision, which is an interesting provision, because what it does is it carves out from what we might ordinarily see as forms of expression areas which do not fall within the protection. So it's a definitional limitation in the clause, and that limitation says that the right does not extend to propaganda for war, incitement of imminent violence, or advocacy of hatred that is based on wraith, race, ethnicity, gender or religion, and that constitutes incitement to cause harm. Um, the, this formulation, these formulations are drawn from the international, um, inter, international law, in particular the um, um, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So you find that this language does come out of international law, but it means that these areas are completely excluded from speech that is protected under the Constitution. For the rest, and they're rather narrowly drawn, and when I come back to talk about hate speech, you'll note that the constitutional protection is speech that is, um, that is uh, advocacy of hatred on the grounds of uh, race, ethnicity, gender, or religion. It's just those four grounds, and that constitutes incitement to cause harm. In fact, that, in terms of modern understandings of hate speech, is rather a narrow exclusion. That doesn't mean, however, that South Africa can't regulate hate speech differently because if other forms of speech which might constitute, be co considered to constitute hate speech fall within the protection, limitation of the protection of speech is nevertheless justifiable and under our constitution. So once you have the right and you say everyone has the right to, to a particular form of expression, if the speech which is regulated by the state falls within that, the state can still limit that, uh, your speech in that way, but it must show that it's reasonable and justifiable to do so in an open and democratic society. Sorry, so, can I just interrupt you? Yes, you of course. The exemption is advocacy of hatred on grounds of race, ethnicity, etc. Religion, yes. But and then, that and is incitement to cause harm. So that you have to meet both tests exactly. to be not covered by the freedom. Exactly. So, you can, so that's why yeah. it's quite a narrow definition of hate yeah. speech. And, and when I get to talk about hate speech a little bit more uh, later on, you'll see that our our legislative framework, in other words, which has been enacted by Parliament, but which is not our constitution, 
has stronger protections on hate speech, which have never actually been challenged under the Constitution, which they could be. Um, I'm not saying that they would be successfully challenged, but all legislation can be challenged. But it's a, it, does not, it is not limited to this um, exclusion that is found in the Constitution. Okay. Um, so this two-phase process of protection of constitutional rights is, um, again, a relatively modern approach to constitutional rights, somewhat different, for example, to what you'd have under the European Convention, um, more like what you get in, under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, because what it recognises is that the rights are not absolute. It's, they're not complete trump cards that you put on the table. It recognises that at times it's justifiable to limit rights, and a lot of the jurisprudence before the court or the cases before the court can be about whether the when Parliament has decided to limit a right, it's done so in a way that's justifiable. And it recognises that at times there are other considerations which outweigh the rights. Some of the cases I will talk about in a minute will give you some idea of how that's worked in relation to speech. So that's the big protection in the Bill of Rights. The, um, what's important to realise about our Bill of Rights is that it's a justiciable Bill of Rights. That means that the courts have the power to enforce the Bill of Rights even against conduct of the President or conduct of Parliament. In that way, it's a stronger Bill of Rights in terms of the powers it gives courts than you'd have, for example, under the UK Human Rights Act. Um, the court can declare legislation enacted by a Parliament to be inconsistent with the Constitution and invalid. Indeed, it has a duty to do that. It, it can't waver. If it finds that something Parliament has done is inconsistent with the Constitution, it must declare that act uh, or that legislation um, invalid. So it's a, it gives a very strong role to the courts and particularly to the constitutional court in determining the validity of legislation. In addition to the protections in the Bill of Rights, there is another chapter in our constitution which is called the Chapter 9, the State Institutions to Support Constitutional Democracy. And one of the provisions in that chapter requires there to be an independent authority to regulate broadcasting. So it recognises that broadcasting in particular uh, is uh, an important part of the way in which uh, communication happens uh, in South Africa and that it should not be regulated by government of the day. It should be regulated by an independent agency. And it goes on to say that in regulating that, it should ensure fairness and a diversity of views broadly representing South African society. So there's an implicit premise there, or perhaps an explicit premise, which is that the broadcasting uh, corporations or the broadcasting agencies should not be narrowly skewed or narrowly represented. They should be, in fact, broadly represented. And, of course, that's a direct rebuttal of our history where we had one state broadcaster only, both in TV and in radio. And this was recognising that actually there was going to be a much more freer access to broadcasting, but that in regulating that shouldn't be within the control of government, it should actually be in control of an independent agency that should ensure fairness and representativity. Um, so, those are the constitutional provisions. So where are we in South Africa? Well, according to Reporters Without Borders, uh, we rank 31st on uh, their 2017 Index of Press Freedom which is behind Namibia, interestingly, 24th, which is the leading African country, and South Africa would come in second. And ahead of the United Kingdom, you'll be interested to know, which ranks 40th, 40. and the United States, which ranks 43rd. Um, South Africa, uh, on the other hand, is recognised by Freedom House to be considered as only partly free on their Freedom of the Press Index, which scores high in relation to the legal environment, but low on the political environment. And here there's a difference between Freedom House and um, Reporters Without Borders because Freedom House would rate the United Kingdom as free, whereas South Africa only as partly free. It begins to immediately realise that assessments of media freedom uh, are not that, uh, without controversy, and not that easy to do. So leaving aside those assessments, just to talk a little bit about the, the kind of media environment, um, South Africa has a pretty vibrant uh, print media environment. We have uh, probably what you could say is five major uh, press houses. Naspers, which is the, uh, a, a basically an Afrikaans-speaking um, uh, uh, press house, which publishes major newspapers such as Die Bild, Die Burger, and Report, but also publishes really the only or the fastest growing South Africa newspaper, which is the Daily Sun, which is a tabloid 
style newspaper which publishes a lot of things which would nowadays be referred to as fake news, I think. Um, but it has a huge readership, in fact, the largest readership of any newspaper in South Africa. Um, then there's independent newspapers, which has been a long stalwart, by and large, English language newspaper, although it has got some Zulu, um, I, I, I Zulu language papers, such as Isol but it publishes Cape Argus, Cape Times, The Star, Mercury, Pretoria News, and The Sunday Independent. As its name suggests, for a long time it was part of Tony O'Reilly's uh, independent group. In fact, I'm told I've never actually done the work myself, but by one of its uh, leading editors that it was one of the most successful financially of, the, of that group and was sold about three or four years ago to a consortium in South Africa, uh, somewhat controversially, uh, with um, a consortium made up with some funding from China and a group called the Second Jala Investments and also support from our public investment corporation. Then there's the th a third group would be Times Media and Kahiso, published Sunday Times, Business Day, The Financial Mail, and The Sowetan. And fourth, and again somewhat controversially, there's a new entrant into the major press houses, Oak Bay Investments, a company which is controlled by a family famous in South Africa, the Guptas, and they own a newspaper called The New Age, which again somewhat controversially refuses to submit itself to um, circulation auditing. What are they uh, famous for, the Guptas? They are famous for having a close relationship with our president, which okay. is uh, widely considered to be <laughs> not above board. Okay, thank you. And um, how do they make their money? Um, sorry? Where's their money come from? Well, they came to South Africa in 1993 or 1994 with no money and are now extremely wealthy. And um, uh, the precise source of their money, I, I wouldn't be able to say okay. with great liability. Okay. Um, then the uh, fifth group is Caxton, which is a sort of a daily um, free sheet a group that you know, uh, kind of knock and drop papers that you get in your local neighbourhoods, as well as a newspaper which was very notorious in the 1970s for uh, being an early uh, denizen of fake news, The Citizen, who used by the apartheid uh, government to uh, publish um, uh, stories favourable to it. And then there are, of course, some small, important, independent titles like the M&G Media, the Mail and Guardian, a long-standing mm. stalwart of uh, sort of progressive reporting in South Africa. Um, generally, like in the rest of the world, um, uh, readership is 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 stagnant, if not falling. Say for, as I say, this rather this outlier with the Daily Sun, um, and we're seeing quite a big uh, shift, uh, failure, as it were, in the business model that's affecting the press elsewhere as well. Um, in broadcast media, we've seen a dramatic change, of course. We have still had the South African Broadcasting Corporation, which under the new constitutional framework and legislation enacted in terms of it, was formulated as a public broadcaster, very much uh, in theory along the model of a public broadcaster like the BBC. Um, it has very wide access, very w widely watched by South Africans, um, but it, it has been a, a gone through a lamentable period uh, in relation to governance and management, and it's certainly it's uh, it, it, it's there's been a recent new board appointed, uh, but it, there's a wide worry about the extent to which one could fairly say that the SABC is in fact doing a good job as a public broadcaster. There's quite a lot of case law on that, which I could refer to as well. Just, In addition, just, just yeah. to sort of summarise, when you say doing a good job, you said earlier the constitutional provisions that it has to be independent, etc. Is the question about its professionalism or its independence? So both, probably, I okay. think. Um, you know, as with many South African institutions, there's been a, an imperative to um, to change the racial mix of people who manage, racially work in it. These, you know, the apartheid state was a project of um, empowering and protecting white South Africans, and institutions across the board in South Africa mm -hmm. have had to go through a real fundamental change. And the SABC, of course, is uh, one of those which most importantly must do that. But um, there is uh, the current, or uh, there has been a CEO of the SABC in recent times who has, uh, I think, uh, made some decisions which have been widely uh, dis disapproved of. Um, they've ended up before um, the independent regulator um, mm. for making decisions. For example, uh, in the lead up to the local government elections in 2016 last year, there was a, quite a, a large amount of public discontent and pu public protest leading to some very vi to some violence and the public broadcaster issued a policy saying that it wasn't going to uh, in its news programs broadcast any any footage of 
of public violence because they didn't think it was in the public interest mm. to do so, and they were taken to the in, the regulator to have this declared to be uh, inconsistent with their duty to provide fair and accurate reporting of the news. So it's those sorts of things okay. that have been uh, controversial. Thank you. Um, in addition to SABC, uh, which, you know, which one could spend a very long time talking all on its own, there are now two commercial free-to-air TV stations. Um, uh, the most established of those is ETV. Primary shareholder is Hoskin Consolidated Investments, are largely linked into the union movement. And a more recent entrant, and again uh, somewhat uh, controversial, AWN7, ANN7, which is owned by a group called Essel Media, widely understood to be controlled again by the same family, the Gupta family, who control um, uh, New Age. Uh, then there is a big satellite pay TV uh, um, sector, which is control controlled effectively by NASPERS, the, one of the media houses, um, through their multi-choice DSTV, but that, that provides, as satellite television does all over the world, access to a whole bouquet of stations, including the BBC and Sky and uh, a whole range of American uh, uh, ones as well. And they, in fact, are making big moves into the rest of Africa. So this is one of the companies that is you know, mm. spreading news through Africa through a pay-as-you-go pay system. And then radio stations. I mean, I think one of the things that has flourished in the post-apartheid period has been a whole array of new radio. Uh, community radio, commercial radio, um, having had this really rather dull diet of SABC, a dull and, and biased diet of SABC, um, there's been a real um, uh, change in, in radio. Um, and again, with some cross-ownership into the press, into the, into the print media, but also some quite established um, uh, companies on their own, such as Prime Media, um, who own uh, several of the major talk radio stations. Online media, again, uh, quite a big move in online media. Um, we have a news, again, part, you know, partly done by the, the, the established print media, independent newspapers as IOL, News24 is one from NASPERS, um, etc. And then so a couple of independent ones. South Africa's internet penetration is high for Africa, over 50%. Um, and indeed, we have 24.9 million internet users out of a population of about 55 million and 14 million Facebook subscribers. So for Africa, reasonably high uh, internet uh, uh, saturation and presence. Um, so the way in, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the way in which the press is ordered. And first, the state ordering under this... Um, both under the legislation, but um, in terms of agencies under this independent constitutional body, which in fact is called ICASA, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. It's independent, it's statutory, it, it regulates media by both granting licenses um, and um, issuing regulations for the way in which license can be done. It also covers uh, telecommunications and postal services. So quite early on, in 2000 in fact, so South Africa decided to regulate broadcast, telecommunications and postal services under one agency, recognizing the growing together of uh, the way in which media was working. And so ICASA does all of those. Um, it has a Compl Complaints and Compliance Committee which deals with the breach of, reg of, of license conditions. So, for example, the case I mentioned to you about SABC and not publishing as part of news p political protests was dealt with by the ICASA Complaints and Compliance Committee under and was a question as to whether they were complying properly with their both statutory framework and the regulations. But most of the regulation of press actually is under non-state ordering systems. And I use non-state ordering because it can't really call it private, I don't think. But basically, there is the Press Council, which is something one sees in many Commonwealth countries, uh, revamped in 2012, but basically controlled or uh, managed by um, the press industry, uh, the National Association of, um, of, of, of uh, the Editors Forum and the National Association of the Press Associations. And they appoint to their council six members from the press and six from the public. They have a code of ethics which governs the South African print and online media, and they have a complaints process through an ombudsman and an appeals process. Um, several times, government has quite seriously mooted replacing our press council system with a statutory media tribunal, but so far that hasn't happened. 
although it's an endless, I think there's an endless anxiety at the press council and amongst the press generally that we are going to see um, uh, this system replaced with a statutory system. And in fact, in 2016, the independent newspaper group, which I mentioned a moment ago, withdrew from the press council, which as one of the sort of five major media houses, oh, please come up, because don't feel uncomfortable. Um, um, as one of the major media houses, this was somewhat of a blow to the press council. Uh, and they, they uh, you know, deal with complaints, they publish the decisions online, etc. Uh, um, then there is the Broadcasting Complaints Commission of South Africa, which again is um, non-state ordering, set up by the National Association of Broadcasters, but institutionally independent of that association, and it deals with all com content complaints against broadcasters, um, and uh, both TV and radio. And then finally, again, somewhat uh, as in the United Kingdom, we have an active advertising standards authority which deals with complaints against advertisers. So I would say that uh, certainly in number terms, the vast majority of complaints about the press, about advertising, about broadcasting are handled not by the courts, not by state-established institutions, but these non-state mechanisms. Um, so just to turn finally then, or to talk a little bit about what happens with media and the courts, um, one of the areas where there's been quite a close uh, um, relationship between media and the courts has been about the televising of court proceedings. Um, and the courts, the Constitutional Court has held very firmly that courts have a discretion to decide whether or not um, uh, uh, they should permit uh, broadcasting recognizing a principle of open justice so that there's quite a strong weight in the in the scales for recognizing that you would want to broadcast something that is of great public interest. Um, in fact, the court quite recently struck down legislation which prohibited public access to refugee appeal board hearings, saying that the, 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 the appeal boards themselves must determine whether it's appropriate to admit, admit the public and or the press into the hearings. The Constitutional Court permits uh, televising its proceedings on a regular basis. Um, and I have to say that, you know, sometimes I think they can be very dull, but we have had some quite high profile uh, um, hearings of big political matters, which in fact have had very wide following and people rather glued to the television. So sometimes it's dull, but in fact there is quite a lot of coverage of it. Um, and the court from time to time will read its judgments publicly as well. There will be coverage of the of the of judgment reading, most famously in the decision on uh, Nkandla, that's the president's home and the expenditure of, of public funds on the president's home, which was declared to be a breach of the constitution on, of the president's constitutional duties. That was a publicly broadcast judgment. And that went to the constitutional court? Yeah, the Nkandla case. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's unusual to permit, in fact, it's, it's extremely unusual to permit televising of proceedings involving witnesses. Now, most of you will probably find that rather unlikely because quite a few of you watch something of the Oscar Pistorius trial. <laughs> but, in fact, that's about the only case in which um, the televising of witnesses has happened, and I generally, personally, do not think it's an, a desirable practice. I think uh, it, it puts an enormous burden on the witnesses. Uh, it's one thing to have legal argument televised. Counsel can cope with that. Advocates can cope with that. But uh, witnesses, it seems to me, puts them in quite a diff difficult position. Um, so, of course, another area in which media and uh, courts come close together is the area of defamation or the law of libel. Now, although we have a Roman-Dutch legal system, in fact, our law of libel does not look very different to what happens in the United Kingdom, particularly since the new legislation here. Um, and the uh, defamation is the wrongful and intentional publication of a defamatory statement. A defamatory statement is a statement that will harm somebody in their reputation. And the defences to it are... The public, that it's true and it's in the public benefit, not simply that it's true, but that it's in the public benefit for it to be published. Secondly, that the statement constitutes fair or protected comment. Thirdly, that it's privileged. And fourthly, that the publication is reasonable, even if it turns out to be untrue at the end of the day. Now, this question rose, I think, one of the questions that's arisen in most jurisdictions around the world in relation to a decision to publish when an editor is not able to establish that the facts are true, but not able to establish that they're not true either, but nevertheless considers in the public interest to publish it. And this happens all the time. And 
In the United States, this famously happened in the 1960s with the publication of an advertisement which affected a, um, a mayor whose name was Sullivan from a, um, uh, one of the southern towns who was alleged to have been involved in gross sort of breaches of human rights in relation to dealing with civil rights campaigns in the town. And uh, this mayor, Sullivan, challenged the New York Times for publishing this advertisement, which had defamed him. Advertisement, an article. It was an advertisement. It was an advertisement taken out by a whole string of sort of luminaries. It was interesting that the New York Times ended, being, ended up being sued, and not all the people who signed the, it's basically a statement, attacking Sullivan as the mayor for the way he was behaving in Birmingham. And um, the, the, it was clear that some of the statements in this um, advertisement were untrue about what, where he'd been at particular times and what he'd said. Um, and the US Supreme Court held that the New York Times should not be liable uh, in defamation uh, for this defamation of Sullivan because it could not be established that they had acted with actual malice. And that is the test that operates in the United States. If you publish something false about a public figure, unless the public figure can prove that you've acted with actual malice, there will be no claim for libel. Now, pretty well every, certainly English-speaking jurisdiction with which I'm familiar has had New York Times and Sullivan argued to them uh, on the grounds that this is the approach that ought to be taken. <coughs> and pretty well every jurisdiction has refused to establish as protective a test for libel as has been established in the United States. And I think it's fair to say that in most Commonwealth countries, a test has been established, which is one that's been ad adopted in South Africa, adopted here in Re Reynolds and Times, a Theophanus in, in Australia, uh, and so on. And that is that the editor must determine whether, in the light of assessing the extent to which it's uncertain whether the information is true, it's nevertheless such an important point that it should be published anyway. And journalists have always been very anxious about this, feeling that it, it, may, chill, um, it may chill publication. But it's interesting that I can't think of a case in South Africa where, I must say, we don't have a lily-livered press, um, where things have been published which have been harmful about a public figure where they've actually been successfully sued. We do have, not that we don't have some efforts, but mm. so far, that it, the, the, I think this test has stood up. It does mean that you couldn't publish in South Africa a statement that President Zuma was born in Hawaii when he wasn't born in Hawaii, um, and not actually, and, and make some defamatory comment about that, which you would not be able to get away with. So it does put a control on complete <coughs> falsity um, uh, in ways that I worry that the New York Times and Sullivan test doesn't. But that's something we could debate afterwards because it is something I know many journalists who disagree with the courts, uh, courts on this. Um, so the third area I want to talk about briefly is hate speech. This obviously is a excruciatingly difficult uh, issue to regulate in a society that is deeply divided in South Africa on race in terms of uh, um, inequality in terms of life experience and in terms of this devastating history um, of, uh, of racial discrimination that has left us with this uh, very <coughs> deep, uh, deep legacy of inequality. Um, so, as I say, the Constitution itself has a relatively narrow exclusion for hate speech. It says that it won't be speech um, if it's advocacy of hatred and it's going to constitute incitement to cause harm. But under our equality legislation, the, uh, a broader definition has been adopted, which says no person may publish um, words based on race, gender, etc. So racial words that could reasonably cons be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to. Now, this is, this is lawyer speak. <laughs> reasonably construed to demonstrate an intention to be hurtful or harmful or to propagate hatred. So it, it is not a subjective question of what the person intended. It's a question when you look at what's done, would a reasonable person think this looks like it was intended to cause harm? <coughs> so quite a tricky test. And um, we have seen some of these agencies that I've spoken to you about, these non-state agencies grappling with this approach to hate speech. So there was a famous, there is still a famous song in South Africa called Amandia, which is about Indians, uh, and it has its language is racist in that it says it's an Isi Zulu song. Indians don't want to change. Even Mandela has failed to convince them. It was better with whites. We knew then it was a racial conflict. We struggle so much here in Durban as we've been dispossessed by Indians. That's the language of the song. 
and it was um, very controversial in South Africa quite early on, actually, in the early 2000s. And the broadcasting complaints mechanism said, you can't, you can't broadcast this song. It's, it's clearly racist, it's clearly hurtful, um, it, and, and it can't be broadcast. Uh, there was some criticism of that, but that ruling, as far as I understand, still stands. More recently, and as controversially, Julius Malema, who's the leader of one of uh, uh, the opposition parties in South Africa, the Economic Freedom Fighters, uh, was held to have um, uh, been guilty of hate speech, or not guilty of hate speech, but have committed hate speech by singing a song, a very famous South African song, Du Bully Bunu, which means shoot the farmer. And um, he did this on many occasions. There was increasing kind of political roar about it, um, particularly because he's, he's a pretty dramatic performer, um, and he does it with all the necessary staccato noises and bang, 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 and, and movements and so on. And he was referred to the Equality Court um, for a determination. So this is a state-based court. And the court held that the singing of the song did constitute hate speech, and he was interdicted from the singing of the song, and the court also held that the song itself constituted hate speech. There's been no appeal against that ruling. It no originally... Um, Julius Malema said he would appeal. There hasn't been so. Well, that he said he's stands. not allowed to sing the. He's not allowed to sing the song, or people aren't allowed to report him singing. So the song. that's an interesting question. There was never a question about reporting. So he himself was referred to for committing hate speech by singing the song in this okay. provocative way at political yes. rallies. Um, there, there is nothing in the order which says that reporting <coughs> of singing the song is unlawful. So he's stopped singing the song, has he? Perhaps uh, that's an interesting question to which I can't answer. Okay. <laughs> I just don't know. I, I, um, I, I don't know the answer okay. to that question. Somebody here might know whether he sang it since 2011. Okay. It, doesn't, well, it wouldn't completely push the, realm, you know, the realms of credibility to think he possibly might have, but I just don't know. Um, but but it, it was a controversial decision, and, and a lot of people felt that... So, it's a struggle song. Struggle songs obviously have a, a you know a, a legacy going back into the apartheid past, and this idea of controlling songs, um, people felt felt very uh, distressed about. On the other hand, of course, farmers feel very distressed about people going around saying shoot them and shoot them with a gun, and they're bad people. So this is right at the intersection of South African uh, contestation and difficulty in our, and our history, and always difficult when. Uh, legal rulings uh, move into that area. And just to ask a question that's probably obvious to you, when you say shoot the farmer, the assumption is the farmer is white? Yes, I think so. And particularly here, because the, the Isizulu word which is uh, used for farmer is ibunu, which is actually a rough translation from Afrikaans, which is dibur. So it probably even has more of a sense of being an Afrikaner white farmer in its, its connotations. Yeah. So in conclusion then, I mean, I, I also think that it is important to pause and recognize that speech is always going to be contested in democracies. And I think the fact that it's contested in South Africa is a good thing. And the fact that we have a vibrant uh, tradition of both free speech and the press is a good thing. And we're all going to disagree at times on where we should draw the lines. And generally, politicians are not going to like being lambasted in the press or, or, or lampooned. Uh, whether it's cartoonists or um, journalists, and they're going to make noises about wanting to control the press. This is, you know, I think the sort of thing that happens in lots and lots of democracies. I do think that we have a very strong constitutional framework. By and large, the court has uniformly upheld uh, freedom of speech in the press. I mean, famously, the government tried to introduce a um, prior restraint piece of legislation on prior restraint, which would require registration. Uh, in relation to sexually explicit uh, publications, and the court just struck it down and said, we are not going to do prior restraint except in the most exceptional circumstances. So the court's been pretty strong. Um, and yet, more worrying, I think, is the changing business model for the press, which means that the press itself, its own economic uh, uh, future is under threat. Um, and I think this is very much so in South Africa. Um, and the emergence of a uh, digital media, internet-based media, where how successful this is going to be at fulfilling the kind of role we would want a public broadcaster and the media to play in providing people with a relatively even-handed disclosure of what news, what is happening in the country on a daily basis, we are, one must be worried about whether, in fact, um, digital media are going to be able to achieve that. Uh, that kind of a role, and we haven't really in South Africa fully begun to think through 
the implications of uh, how to regulate digital media and how to ensure that um, the broader citizenry gets full access to news that it, um, under the Constitution, is entitled to receive. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>